Um, when I was uh, in high school, I was actually in Brooklyn High, not too far from here. And I think that's the time where I officially became a geek. The first computers were coming out. I was one of these kids that stood at the Radio Shacks at the corner, <laughs> working with the TRS 80s, and then got you know an Apple II and so on. So. Um, Usually, I'm, I'm the CEO of uh, Sensex. I'll tell you a little bit about Sensex and then about the OSVR project that we started together with our friends at uh, Razor. As CEO, I get to give a lot of different presentations. I get to give financial presentations and sales presentations and sometimes technical presentations. So how many people, just raise your hand, uh, how many people are software engineers or, or do sort of a good bit of program? Good, thank you. So. If you don't mind, I'll give a little bit more of a technical presentation today because I'm a, I'm a geek at heart and uh, I think there's a, there's a nice story to be told here. Sensex has been doing VR uh, way before Palmer Lucky invented VR, actually. Uh, we've been doing VR for over a decade. Uh, we started at Johns Hopkins University when Honda gave Hopkins a large research grant to build a super wide, super high resolution head mounted display. Some people here I know have tried it in the past. It, it, has, uh, it had 8 million pixels per eye, 150 degree field of view. So it was really an amazing product even by today's standard. And Honda used it to design the Accord. If you've ever seen a Honda Accord, uh, that was uh, aided by one of the very first Sensex products. So during all these years, we've been serving primarily um, high end professional customers. Here are just a, a partial list of our customers. We have a lot of defense contractors, um, automotive companies, large universities, um, LG, Samsung, NASA, Airbus, GM, and so on and so on. But in the last couple of years, we said, what can we do to bring our expertise and um, technology and our knowledge to impact a greater number of people? Now, we don't have $100 million to go and, and build our own consumer brand. And it turns out that $100 million is not enough anyway. Uh, so we said, we're, we're going to do it a little bit differently. So today we operate in, in three markets. And let's see if this, this thing works. I think it does. So we sell, um, we sell uh, high-end products for primarily military. Uh, we'll show you some of those in a second. Uh, under the Sensex brand. We work with customers on um, low vision devices, so people for, uh, I'm sorry, devices for people with vision disabilities help people see better. And then for our friends with Fraser and other companies, we do gaming goggles and more consumer devices. And what you see here on the sides are products that we've created uh, over the years. Um, the one right there at the top is that uh, super high-end Honda product. This is the smart goggle, which had an Android processor built in and hand tracking that we demonstrated three or four years ago at CES. So there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. But the reason we're able to do all these things is that they all feed off the same core expertise, you know, optics, electronics, image processing, signal processing, understanding of human ergonomics, and so on and so on. So we're able to serve NASA on one hand, and, and a gamer, uh, on the other hand, at least from a technology perspective. So, um, it's gonna, I think it's the last military slide. So, we make products for the military. These are high-end, high-performance head-mounted displays and other devices. What you see here, for instance, are emulated devices. So, this, for instance, is a binocular, except it's not a binocular. When you, when you lift it in front of your eyes, you see a simulated image. It could come over a wireless video link, so you could um, for instance, with one of, one of these uh, simulated uh, rifle shots, you can learn how to shoot in this building without having a real range because you have something that feels like uh, a rifle shot. Uh, this is a mil-spec, mil-standard head-mounted display, which means it can withstand uh, water and uh, you know three feet fall on a concrete surface and extreme temperatures and so on. And in one of my uh, sillier days, I, uh, I took it into the shower in our building and I filmed myself taking a shower with this and it's on our website so if you have nothing better to do, it's just waste, uh, you know, don't worry about it. But uh, I was a few pounds lighter, uh, or many pounds lighter. But it just showed that the product uh, sustained, uh, can sustain water. Uh, this is our second line of products, which is uh, products for people with vision disabilities. Unfortunately, there are nearly three million people in the U.S that have severe vision disabilities. Um, 
So if a person with normal vision has, say, 20-20 vision, or maybe I can wear glasses that bring me closer to 20-20 vision, people with vision disabilities have 20-60 vision or worse in their better eye, even after all the vision correction has been implemented. And so one of the things that happens is that if I had, say, 2100 vision, I, I could not recognize your face if I saw you, which would be a problem because, you know, I, uh, or, or worse, I couldn't recognize facial expressions. And what I can do mostly is sit at home with a big magnifying glass and watch TV and read. And about a third of low vision patients also, also have depression, uh, I think, for many of that reason because they're, they're very limited in what they can do. So we've built a device that's actually now in the clinical trials at Johns Hopkins. Uh, this particular model was shown in the Los Angeles, Los Angeles Times just last week. It's based on a Gear VR, but we have more advanced models. And what it basically does, it magnifies in, in a special way, tailored to you, just the, just the thing you're looking at. So if I'm looking at you, your face would be magnified, would be easier for me to recognize facial expressions and recognize you, but everything else I would still see. So I would get peripheral vision, I wouldn't fall over myself, and so on. This is sort of a simulation of the magnification. You see it's sort of normal magnification here, and as I look here, it's higher magnification. And you know, gaming is fun, and maybe there's a lot of money, but we, when you can make someone see better, that's, that's good for the heart. <laughs> You know, that, that's sort of like making the world a better place, not just I can shoot them up faster. So, so we're very happy that we're involved in, in this project as well. Um, and then we do gaming. So, so this is, uh, we do all kinds of flavors, and, and I think what we're starting to see right now is that, um, so let, let me take it back in time. You know, about 10 years ago, the first Android phone came out. And guess what? The iPhone 3 was already on the market. And so iPhone 3, right? The third generation iPhone was already on the market. Very popular phone. And the first Android was a little bit clunky. But today, <coughs> Android has more than 85% market share. Uh, one reason, because it was free and open source. It didn't constrain people to work in a particular closed system that Apple wanted them to do. So. When we decided to go with our friends at Razer into virtual reality, we said, we're going to do open source, like Android, but the Android of VR. So we're going to do open source hardware, which means that you can go right now to osvr.com, and that's going to take you to a GitHub link, and you can download the schematics, the FPGA, the firmware, the optics, and you can hack it. I mean, you can build your own, you can hack it, you can change it, you can just learn from it, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then there's a software framework, which I'll spend more time talking about, that allows you to do that. So we've built sort of various models. Uh, this is, a, uh, I wish, you know, actually, these are not models. These are just people that tried it at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas when we launched uh, OSVR. They seem to be very happy with it. This is a higher end model in terms of resolution. This is a prototype that we did for uh, out of home VR, meaning uh, virtual reality and entertainment venues, theme parks, roller coasters where they have different requirements, and it needs to be more rugged, needs to be easier to sanitize from user to user, needs to be designed so you can get a lot of throughput of people through the, the attraction without leaving too much uh, you know, hair and lice and sweat um, inside the, uh, the HMD. Um, so, so we do that as well. So we decided to do OSVR open source virtual reality, and a lot of people sometimes focus on the OSVR uh, goggle, the HMD itself, and I, I'm showing demos here which are going to show you that the optics are really nice and it's got some really nice features, but I think the bigger story here is the OSVR software, so in uh, consideration of my geek friends in the audience, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So OSVR has three key parts. It's got, um, you know, it's got the software, the hardware, and then the community which brings it all together and makes it uh, a powerful, a powerful movement. Uh, this is a, a blow up of the uh, OSVR uh, headset, which again, you can just download and build your own if you want it, or you can buy it from Razer for $300 and hack it and change it or do your own things. It's got a powerful FPGA on it. It's got some really nice optics. Um, it, it, it comes fully assembled. This is just 
<laughs> you don't get just a kit and it's not IKEA, right? Uh, IKEA, <laughs> IKEA VR, right? That's, that's the next big thing. Uh, and, but one of the things we, we did when we built the OSVR headset is we took our experience with the professional high-end world and brought it into the consumer world. So, uh, so we built some nice optics and just to show you what we did is we downloaded a resolution chart from uh, Google and I think you probably see some of the browser tabs open there and we put it on a screen and then we took an iPhone, not three I think, um, we took an iPhone and took two photos of the exact same image. The left side was taken with the OSVR optics. The right side uh, was taken with some other product. Uh, you can guess which one. Uh, you know, th this is a DK2, I think. And so you can see some really amazing differences. Um, one thing, I mean, the, the image here in the DK2 is very nice in the center, but as you go out to the edges, you see one that it becomes really unfocused, and you also see color breakup. Uh, now you can correct for geometry with software, and you can correct for color breakup in, ge in software, but you can't really correct for focus. There's no magic way to refocus an unfocused image. But here, the same image with the OSVR optics, you can see that it's clear all the way to the edges. You can see that, that there's no color breakup. You can see that the, you know, the these resolution lines, I mean, just disappear here and they're there. And what that means, it means that you don't have to pre-distort or pre-warp the image. Whatever's shown on your PC or Mac or what have you, you can show in the device. And that's the demo that I'm doing there. I'm showing some nice music videos so you can appreciate the, the optical quality. Uh, why is that important other than saving you time? If you're running it on mobile, that becomes important because all these distortions and corrections eat up battery power and heat and, and, and GPU power from a phone that's not as uh, powerful as a uh, high-end uh, graphics card. Um, but let's talk about the OSVR software. So this is sort of too many words, but let me give an example of what we're trying to do with OSVR API. When you bought a printer last time, did you have to upgrade your word processor? And if the answer is no, then think about why. I mean, I can still send everyone a link to a WordPerfect web page from 20 years ago that had a whole bunch of printer drivers that worked with WordPerfect. And if you got a new computer and you had WordPerfect and you want to work with that printer, you have to download and install that driver. Well, that doesn't happen anymore because when you plug it to Windows, I don't, I don't know about Windows 10, it's brand new, but if you plug it into Windows 8 or 7 or whatever, then Win or Mac says, oh, here's a new printer, this is Epson model so-and-so, I'll download the driver. You don't need to change the app, right? Because the word processor or the application knows how to print to a printer generically in Windows, and there's a print services layer that says, oh, I can translate these generic commands into the specific commands that are relevant to my Epson or HP or Brother or whatever, or Canon, whatever printer I'm using. So OSVR wants to do the same, or does the same, for VR devices, for head-mounted displays, for eye trackers, for motion trackers, for, um, uh, for game engines, and so on and so on. So that means that you don't have, when you write a virtual reality experience, you don't have to select your target head-mounted display. You can say, I'm going to write to Vuzix, or you can say, I'm going to write to Oculus, but Today, you have to make that choice or create multiple versions of your code. And then that's the HMD. But now you say, okay, well, what, what uh, position tracking do I use? Do I use the built-in uh, Oculus position tracking? Or actually, I want to use the uh, Valve position tracking. But now I have a professional application and I have some big, crazy room position tracking. I don't want to write all these drivers. I don't want to chase them all the time. So OSVR does that for you. I mean, you. It creates a, just like the printer example, and you know, Windows has a printer interface and a scanner interface and a fax interface and so on and so on. Similarly, OSVR has an HMD interface and a head tracker and a thing, uh, uh, posture and skeleton and eye tracker and all these various components. So today, as we speak, you know, OSVR supports more than 20 different head-mounted displays, including Oculus supports about a hundred different tracking devices 
supports a bunch of uh, uh, gesture engines, uh, position trackers, and when we launched uh, OSVR, Razer and Sensix launched OSVR in January this year, there were just two companies, Razer and Sensix, that were part of this movement. Today, there are 150 companies in six months. So John and Six Sense and uh, Ubisoft as a game developer and others all say, oh, we think it's a great idea. We don't want to be tied to a certain hardware. We don't necessarily want to be tied to a certain app store. We don't want to necessarily be tied to a certain way of doing things or to the timeline of development of a company in you know, Cupertino or Redmond or Irvine or, or what have you. We want the freedom. <laughs> So, when we made it free and open source, what that allowed us to do is to say, innovators are welcome. So if you're a professor in Germany and your expertise is SLAM, you know, positional tracking based on cameras, you can write a SLAM module for OSVR, you can open source it, which we prefer, or you can say, no, it's closed source, you gotta buy it from me, which is fine for, someone's got, you know, they gotta find a way to make money. But, you have a choice. You don't have to choose just one HMD or just one type of device. So, um, just very quickly, the, the, the marketing gateway for OSVR is OSVR.com. The technical gateway for OSVR is OSVR.github.io, where you can see all the various projects, download the software, again, free, open source. Um, Apache 2.0 license, like Android, which means you can use it. You don't have to contribute your changes back to the community. You can use it for whatever you want. Uh, commercial, academic, just go for it. You know, knock yourself up. Um, so this is just a snapshot of you know the main developer portal, and this is from a, a little while ago. Uh, some of the projects there. You've got OSVR Unity, which is a, a open source you know, Unity plugin. OSVR Unreal, uh, Distortionizer, which is a program to measure distortion on your HMD. You've got an HMD that you don't know what the distortion function is. You can put it on, get the line straight in the distortionizer, and it spits out the coefficients for the OSVR open source um, shader. So all these game engines all automatically say, oh, okay, I've got the coefficients. I know how to fix that stuff. Uh, yesterday, we made public an alpha version of OSVR Steam. So you want to play Steam games on OSVR, there's still some bugs to fix there, that's why it's an alpha version, but it's there. Five hours. <laughs> you wish. Um, in terms of, um, I can go into the architecture, you can go, you look at that a little bit in, on, on the website. It's a modular architecture, plugin architecture. So you have device plugins, you have uh, plugins for, uh, of course, game engines, you have plugins for what we call analysis, like you could have a face recognition module that accepts a video from, or an image from a camera with a generic interface, of course, not a specific camera, and says this is John or this is David. So you can mix and match these devices. So the, the outcome is that when we have games that run on OSVR, um, to move from one HMD to the other, from one tracking system to the other, all it takes is change a config file, like the printer dialog box in Windows. You don't have to recompile the app. You don't have to do something crazy. You just do it. So you launch a game in 2015 and next year there's going to be a better uh, HMD or a better Meta or a better Vervana or so on. That's great. Just get a driver, have them write it or it's open source if you can't wait, write it yourself um, and do it this way. Uh, 150 companies have are part of OSVR, you know, from game engines to game developers to HMDs, tracking and so on. Uh, the slides can't keep up with reality here because I think this only shows, I don't know, uh, 70 or 80 of them. Um, just uh, real quick in terms of components, OSVR talks about a couple different entities, devices, which are physical devices. Uh, interfaces. Interface, think about a, um, I go back to the desktop, right, but think about a multifunction printer. So you've got a multifunction device, could have a printer and a scanner and a fax and so on. But to Windows, it looks like three different devices, right? It looks like a printer and a scanner and a fax and something else. It just happened to be in the same physical box. So similarly, in OSVR speak, 
a device could have multiple interfaces. So a Razor high drive, which I think an interface for the left hand, a position interface for the right hand, orientation interfaces, button sets, and so on. A um, soft kinetic uh, sensor, which, which is used by uh, Meta, I think, has an imager interface, which is a camera, and has a small motion tracker, but of course it's got a depth and so on. So, so we've got a way to break down a device not by what it's called, but by what it does. Um, these interfaces are well defined. This is just a screen capture from the OSVR website. This shows an eye tracker interface. So if you have your own eye tracker, what do you need to do to conform to the OS OSVR spec, which by the way is open source and is community driven, so it's not just you know, me or someone else saying this is how it's going to be. I wish it were, but it's not. Um, it's, so when we worked on the eye tracking interface, we, for instance, went to SMI, we went to Arrington, we went to Toby and said, yeah, what do you think? Does this make sense? Should we change something? And they did. You can even, uh, you know, they say sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? You can, you can go on GitHub and see some of the history of the discussions on the eye tracking interface, so it, it's done in the open. Not, not some um, backroom deals. Um, you can, as a programmer, you can work with an interface both synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous meaning, I want the state now. Give me your latest position. Or you can say, no, no, give me a callback, give me an interrupt, or call a function when something happens. And so you see developers working both ways, depending on how their code is written. You can have, for instance, a main loop that reads the head tracker continuously but you can have a callback for I got a new image or I got a new face recognized or there's a new gesture or what have you because you maybe you don't want to pull for gestures a hundred times a second. Um, uh, we got we break down the, the, the physical devices so this is a nod ring um, but let me show you something else I'll skip this in the interest of uh, not using all my five hours. Uh, one of the um, one of the ways we, we get this device independence is that the application doesn't ask for give me the second position tracker from the Razor Hydra because if we did that then you're tying it to a particular piece of hardware. What we do, the application says give me, it's almost like a directory path, give me me slash hand slash left which gives me all the indication of my left hand you know, position, orientation, fingers and so on. And then that is internally mapped into uh, lower level stuff. So here's a Razor Hydra and it's got two trackers, zero and one, and someone, which could be you or the application, said we're going to use this as the left hand. So when you ask for left hand, me left hands, it could come from a Razor Hydra, it could come from a Kinect, it could come from something that calculates my arm position based on arm sensors. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. Some could be better than others, of course, just like some printers are better than others, but it's not hardware independent. So the outcome is this, you know, if you are a, a hardware manufacturer, so you are Leap Motion, uh, which uh, is an OSVR members, right, or your SMI, or Prio VR, or so on, and you want to work with a game engine, previously you had to say, okay, I'm going to write a plugin for Unity and I'm going to write a plugin for Unreal and then SteamVR and WebVR and Crytek and Monogame and Unigine and VBS and who knows what else is going on. That's a lot of work. Not only is it a lot of work for you, it's also a lot of work for them because think about the poor Unreal product manager that gets bombarded with 15 people who makes the next best gesture engine. So what we propose instead is a much cleaner approach which say okay you've got a eye tracker write an eye tracker plugin or we'll help you write it for OSVR and then we are working directly with all these guys to optimize the OSVR interface so for instance we are working today with uh, Unreal on how should the eye tracking interface to Unreal be so it doesn't matter which eye tracker you use maybe today Meta is the best uh, AR solution but tomorrow is going to be the HoloLens 2 and in two years it's going to be the Meta 3 and who knows? Why do you have to change the game again and again? Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is OSVR runs on Windows, Linux, Android. So same Unity app could, could just run on all these platforms. Uh, I'm sure someone will take it to OSX. 
uh, soon. Um, so in summary, right, that's what you want to hear, Jeff. In summary, <laughs> here's why you should think about using OSVR. I mean, first is support multiple devices, operating system, and game engines. Why limit yourself to any device on the market, to a single device on the market, as good as you think it is right now? On the other hand, if you're developing an experience, you know, why limit yourself to this? Or if you're developing hardware, why limit yourself to only the game engines that you can write plugins for? The programming model, not only is it open source, it's, it's the same model for uh, all the operating systems. So it's the same code, it's the same concept, it's the same plugins. Of course, there are some low-level details that are different between Android and Windows and Linux. I mean, uh, I can make the world a better place. I can't fix everything, though, right? Uh, but from the app standpoint, whether it's OpenGL or Unity, you don't care where it comes from. Uh, optimized game engine interfaces. So we are working directly with Unity on one hand, with NVIDIA to make you know direct rendering, and uh, so you can get uh, bypass say the Windows drivers and go directly to NVIDIA regardless of which HMD you're using. So you get all these benefits of sort of a. And and by the way, if we don't work fast enough for you, just do it yourself. It's open source. There's no just you know do it. Create a pull request. We're happy to have contributions. Some of the contributors we hire, you know, um, are going back to the Android, the first Android versus the iPhone 3. I cannot show you today, you know, just being completely honest, I cannot show you today experiences that are as good as what you can see on a, uh, you know, Crescent Bay, because there's a lot of marketing dollars and content dollars that went there. But I can show you an increasingly complete set of capabilities from direct rendering to distortion measurement to a much wider range of input devices and catching up very quickly that I think you should consider OSVR. Uh, we do not force you to distribute in a particular way, not on an Android store, not on an Oculus store. You can distribute it any way you want. And because it's free and open source, I mean, it's the right price, right? And you also don't have to be worried. You, you, some of you have, uh, you know, government clients. Is Facebook tracking what you're doing or not? Well, it's open source. You can find out that or not, right? So you have the security and being a, of being able to fix what you want and seeing exactly how it works on making intelligent decisions yourself and using the power of the community to move this forward. So with that, i um, happy to open the floor for any questions. Okay. So this particular demo is not head track. Okay, no problem. Again, just uh, focusing on the uh, image quality. Yeah, it's actually, it's really nice. But I do like it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's so it's a 1080p low persistence solar. Oh, nice. And uh, you know these optics are, we think they're pretty good because they yeah. maintain the image quality all the way to the edges. And yep. Wow. That's people also like the adjustment because you know, it's hard to do a one size fits all. And yes. Uh, everyone uh, has different eye separation, or yep. some people need glasses. And, uh, yeah, this is really cool. Yeah, it's nice to have be able to manually adjust this without like you know taking a screwdriver or a penny to the thing right. on the DK2. Yeah, Can you tell us what is your impression of what you just experienced? Tell sure. us about it. Absolutely. So the headset that I just tried on is uh, very comfortable and uh, it fits nicely, easy to put on, easy to take off. Um, it also um, has very good uh, screen quality um, and there doesn't appear to be any any blurring or artifacts or anything like that. So um, and I have to, I'd have to say that 
Uh, out of the many headsets I've tried, this is definitely up there and it's definitely worth uh, giving, a, giving a shot when you have a chance. Great. Now, before so, you leave, give yeah. us your name and tell us about your company because I heard you talk about oh, your sure. own uh, show that you're starting up. So just give us a little Absolutely. plug for that. So my name is Ken and um, I uh, help out with the show. I'm one of its producers on Gunner's Universe. And uh, it's a show that goes on uh, every Tuesday and it's uh, about uh, VR and AR uh, related uh, uh, topics and uh, projects that people work on. We have indie developers. We have uh, companies, uh, you know, coming on to talk about their their new technology or service or software. Uh, so it's a uh, it's a great way to come and meet uh, the community and uh, and have some fun. Okay. All right. So tell us a little bit about your company. So Sensex has been in the VR industry for over a decade. Uh, we traditionally make um, high end products for defense contractors, for car companies, for universities, and so on. In the last couple of years, we started focusing our efforts on more consumer applications, um, both for people with vision disabilities, we have a really nice product for that, and then also this, open source VR, uh, which is geared towards uh, gaming and uh, consumer electronics companies. I think it's fantastic that your software is open source because it gives people an opportunity to jump in and to change it, but you don't require them to have to give it back to the community. What impacted that decision? Well, we were trying to follow the Android model. So Android basically says to Samsung, look, you can take Android as a great base, but you can make Samsung-specific improvements, and it's okay to keep them belonging to Samsung. And same with LG or Motorola or Asus or anyone else. So we want the same to happen with VR, and I think that by having a permissive license, we encourage innovation, we allow people to experiment with it, and uh, you know, we hope they give back to the community, but they certainly don't have to. I mean, I think that this, the concept of open source allows, allows a lot of people to participate. You could be an expert in a particular field anywhere in the world and say, I want to contribute in this area. I don't have the funds or the money to build the entire headset, but I'm an expert in you know, reading brainwaves. So I'll have a reading brainwaves module for OSVR. And we have been just floored by the contributions coming in from all over the world, people that we never knew were interested in VR are trying it out, making contributions, and you know, so the power of the community. All right, so thank you so much for your time, for your great presentation, for this awesome demo. Thank you for coming here to Boston VR. Okay. Uh, yeah. Venkat here from uh, John Hancock, but I'm, I'm here uh, by myself. I'm uh, a VR, uh, AR enthusiast. Wow. Um, I have a Google Cardboard and I play around with uh, Unity 3D for, for my own experiments, but then I'm interested in learning about what new devices, what new technologies, what frameworks are forming. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, you attended tonight's event, right? Mm -hmm. So, what did you think about? About it. Uh, again, I've been following uh, the meetup, the v Boston VR uh, meetup for, for a while. And, uh, thank you, was, thank you for that plug. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> today's one was really impressive, as, uh, especially because of uh, OS VR, because uh, it was always my concern about uh, virtual reality, uh, especially with the devices, that there are so many different devices coming up. How is there going to be a standardization if I get into uh, creating software or games? How can I ensure that they all work in tandem uh, together. I don't have to keep programming for new devices all the time. Wow, that's a good question. Yeah, so OSVR, it's open source and uh, they have the open specifications. So if you're a hardware developer, if you stick to OSVR, then I can write programs for you. Not me, but... No, oh, not you. There. You you could, but not you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, all right. Developers out there. But yeah, so that's why I was impressed with uh, uh, OSVR as a farmer, but then...